Hello and thanks for listening. The following is the audio version of the book, You Must Be Born Again. Both a printed version and ebook version are available. To request either one free of charge, contact me at the email address listed here. There are additional footnotes and references included in the printed and ebook versions, so it may be worth your while if this topic interests you. This audiobook is broken into five parts. All five are in the playlist on the YouTube channel at Hope in Dark Times. Thanks again. Part 2. Today I have begotten you. Psalm 2, 6 through 8 is a messianic prophecy about Jesus. In it, Yahweh God is speaking, and he says, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. The writer of this psalm then says, I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. Although the writer, David, indicates God had directed this to him personally, we know that it had truly been meant for his much later descendant, Jesus, who would be born some 1,000 years later. We know this because the Apostle Paul, inspired by God's Holy Spirit, said the following during his famous sermon, laying out the evidence that Jesus was the promised Messiah in a synagogue at Antioch, Acts 13, 28 through 37. And though they found in him no guilt worthy of death, they asked Pilate to have him executed. And when they had carried out all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead, and for many days he appeared to those who had come up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are now his witnesses to the people. And we bring you the good news that what God promised to the fathers, this he has fulfilled to us their children by raising Jesus. As also it is written in the second psalm, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. And as for the fact that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption, he has spoken in this way, I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David. Therefore he says also in another psalm, You will not let your holy one see corruption. For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid with his fathers and saw corruption, but he whom God raised up did not see corruption. As evident in the quote, Paul's primary emphasis in his argument for Jesus as the Messiah centered on his resurrection from death. Additionally, he highlights that the Psalm 2.7 and 16.10 which he cites in his sermon, were not actually referring to David despite their initial appearance, but were consistently about Jesus. The concepts of begetting and not being left to decompose in the grave were consistently associated with Jesus, and he indeed fulfilled these prophecies. To be begotten simply denotes being born or brought forth. When we apply the prophecy of Psalm 2-7 to Jesus' resurrection, we can indeed assert that through resurrection, Jesus was born again in a physical yet symbolic sense. While John 3-16 refers to him as God's only begotten Son, the meaning behind this term is evidently distinct. Jesus' status as God's only begotten Son prior to his resurrection emphasized the unique nature of his conception and birth, brought about by the power of God unlike the natural biological means by which the rest of us are conceived and born. In this case, there was no human father involved. Although Adam and Eve also lacked a human father, their existence resulted from direct creation, not conception, so they couldn't be described as begotten. In contrast, Jesus had been begotten in a very literal sense as he had been conceived, grew inside his mother, and was born. Further confirmation of this can be gleaned from the statement made by the angel who visited Mary, the mother of Jesus. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. Luke 1.35 Notice the word, therefore. It was because God himself, through his Holy Spirit, brought about Mary's conception that Jesus would bear the title Son of God. Such an event had never occurred in history and would never happen again in this manner. The prophecy of Psalm 2-7 meant something quite different, however. This prophecy, as interpreted by the Apostle Paul, was fulfilled not at Jesus' birth, but at his resurrection. 
Jesus had been born once, grew, and came into adulthood in a very natural human way. But at his resurrection, he experienced being begotten again. This is exactly what the simple language of this prophecy tells us, and Paul confirms it. It was a rebirth, not in the natural biological sense, that Jesus referred to when conversing with Nicodemus. In response to Nicodemus's confusion, Jesus had conveyed to him straightforwardly, Unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. John 3, 5. Jesus then eliminates a natural biological birth as the solution to the question by stating, That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. John 3, 6. It is evident then that Jesus was not discussing the process that occurs when a child is conceived and travels through the birth canal. This was a spiritual transformation that makes the individual being born spirit. What was his intended meaning? Once again, we turn to the writings of the Apostle Paul. In the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians, which is famously referred to as the resurrection chapter, Paul draws a comparison between the mortal, fleshly body and the body a person receives during resurrection. He states, 1 Corinthians 15, 42 through 47, So is it with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It's raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural, and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. Jesus became a life-giving spirit. He was raised a spiritual body. All of this appears unfamiliar and strange to most people. When Jesus was resurrected, he evidently possessed substance, as his disciple Thomas was able to touch the place where the spear had pierced his side, John 20:27. 20, Jesus was also capable of eating, John 21, 9 through 14. Nevertheless, he could seemingly pass through locked doors, John 20:19. And he was able to walk alongside his own disciples without being recognized. John 20, 11 through 18 and Luke 24, 13 through 27. What had occurred to Jesus at his resurrection? To put it in his own words, at his resurrection, Jesus was born of the Spirit. In his conversation with Nicodemus, Jesus emphasized the necessity of being born of water and the Spirit as a prerequisite to accessing the kingdom of God. It was only a short time later in this discussion that Jesus mentioned eternal life, John 3.16. Although the Apostle Paul in the present tense affirms that God has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, Colossians 1.13, we know that he, along with other New Testament writers, also anticipated a future time when the kingdom of God and Christ would be physically established on the earth. This kingdom, where Jesus would physically be present and reign alongside his saints, is occasionally referred to as the age to come. Jesus conveyed to a group of Sadducees, The sons of this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are considered worthy to attain to that age and to the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage, for they cannot die any more, because they are equal to angels and are sons of God being sons of the resurrection. Luke 20, 34 through 36. 